Well, good morning, and we just want to welcome you once again to our Sunday school class as we're doing it over the internet. We appreciate your participation in the uh, in this uh, in this service uh, as you've joined us here this morning. And before we go any further, let's just go to the Lord in prayer. Precious Heavenly Father, it is a wonderful privilege, Lord, to be able to boldly come into your throne room this morning. And Father, to know that by thy grace, you know what our needs are even before we come in. But Father, we know that it pleases you for us to come. And so, Father, we do this morning. Father, we want to lift up all of those that are listening here this morning. Father, there's needs out there. There's financial needs. There's physical needs. There's all kinds of different needs that are out there. Emotional needs. Just so many things going on in our lives. So much uncertainty, too. People concerned about jobs. People concerned about what's going to happen next. But Lord, let us always remember, if we're here as children of God this morning, that it is all truly in your hands. And Father, there isn't anything that's going to happen in this world and happen to us individually that you don't already know about and you haven't already known about before the world ever was. So Lord, we just ask you this morning to give us the wisdom and the confidence To help us to grow in our faith and in our trust of you for all things. And to know, Lord, that we truly are looking forward to the day that we're going to gloriously be in your presence. But Father, until that time, we know we can trust you in this world as well. And we just ask you to help us in these areas here this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. As we've been studying in the, in, the, in the epistle to the Hebrews, we've seen throughout the entire study, throughout all 12 chapters that we've looked at thus far, there's been an argument and ex, a great exhort, a, a, exhortation of this epistle. And it seems to have reached its solemn and impressive conclusion at the end of chapter 12. Particularly in consideration, the very last verse of that chapter that we looked at last week, when it, when it read in, in verse 29, For our God is a consuming fire. You know, we've seen in this study thus far the nature and the power of faith, particularly as we looked at those precious uh, saints of the Old Testament in chapter 11. We've, we've seen how, how we've been exhorted and, and to, uh, to apply the same principles that they, as, as, they, as they had in our lives to, to our lives as well, to manifest the same steady confidence in God and in the, pre- and, 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 and in the perseverance of And as we uh, are continuing our study in the book of Hebrews, it's good for us to remember that verses 1 through 12 kind of complete one section of of, of this book. And in chapter 12, we see the argument and the exhortation of this epistle, and it seems to have reached its solemn and its impressive conclusion. Consider, consider particularly that very last verse that we read in chapter 12 in verse 29 when it says, for God is a consuming fire. In our study through, through the book of Hebrews, we've seen the nature and the power of faith, particularly in chapter 11 with those heroes of the faith. And we are encouraged to apply those same principles to our own lives, to manifest the same steady confidence in God and in the preservation in, of, of, of our holy walk as we saw of their holy walk. And most importantly, not to fall short or not to, or not to, or not to come or not to uh, fall short, or, or not to come all the way to Christ through faith. That is so important. So many have come part of the way, or come almost all the way, but have not come all the way, as we saw last week in our study. And to live now in the power and the wisdom that comes with a unique personal relationship with Christ. But we find in this, in this closing chapter, it closes with a tender appeal to the reader to be loyal to Christ, and follow him in all the ways of life, especially in brotherly love, kindness and purity and goodness, with increasing with with with, un, with unceasing prayer and unwavering faith. The message of Hebrews as a whole endures unchanged, and thus this chapter of the book is a practical conclusion to all that has preceded it. In this chapter, we will also note a very personal relationship seems to be be better established. If we look, we see in this chapter the personal pronoun I is used for the very first time throughout this whole book. 
Also, we may see that we you may notice the word "let your" instead of "let us," as we've seen in a lot of our other studies. In chapter thirteen, we think that the primary theme is love, and I would also add a personal relationship that we are to have this personal relationship with the Lord. It's a it's an undying expression of Jesus's doctrine of heavenly love. It is love, that is, that the church is, is probably church, the church's most powerful weapon. Love without, without which all of the various gifts of the Spirit are literally of no avail. We see that if we looked at in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Love is the es- essence of God's nature. Love is the perfection of the human character. And love, the most powerful and unique force in the universe. You see, my friends, God is love. If we look at 1 John first, uh, verses uh, 7 and 8, verse 4, I mean chapter 4 and verses 7 and 8, we read, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and every one that loveth is born of God and known of God. And he that loveth, loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. We see that that chapter tells, that verse tells us that God is love. Now for our scripture in this morning, we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 7, In chapter 13 of Hebrews. Let us begin. Let brotherly love continue. Be not forgetful to entertain strangers. For thereby some have entertained angels unaware. Remember them that are in bonds. As bond with them. As bound with them. And them which suffer adversity. As being yourselves also in the body. Marriage is honorable in all. And the bed undefiled. But whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as you have. For he has said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. So that we may be bold and say, The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do to me. Remember them that have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God whose faith followeth, consider the end of their conversation. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. Father, we just thank you for this portion of Scripture. Now let's go, now let's go back and look at verse 1. It says, let, let brotherly love continue. It's kind of interesting it says the word continue. It doesn't say, well, let's, you, know, you need to focus on brotherly love or you need to try to have brotherly love. It says it's going to continue. In other words, you should already have that. If you're a child of God, you, it's, it should be a part of your nature now. You know, brotherly love, we look at that expression, and in the Greek, it, 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 it's, he, it's H-E-E, Philadelphia, which means the love of the brethren. So the love that's really being spoken of here has to do with the love that we have for one another in the Lord, which always refers to that relationship between God's people. You see, the Christian life is a practical life. And the driving force behind everything is love. Again, in 1 Corinthians 13, if we looked at just the last verse of that, uh, we see these these words as it sums up that, that whole chapter. It says, the word of God reminds us that love is greater than faith and hope. In 13, 13 it says, now abideth faith, hope, charity. These three, but the greatest of these is charity. Charity is another word for love. So we see that the word of God is telling us how important love is. It's one of the, it's an absolute uh, fundamental um, uh, doctrine of the faith that we must have as children of God. You see, it's love that first conceived salvation's plan in eternity past. It's love that brought the Son of God from heaven to die for sinners on, on the cross. It's love that shed abroad in the hearts of the believers by the Spirit of God. In other words, we, as a child of God, the moment that you were saved, you became a new creation in, in Christ. And as a part of that new creation, that manifestation, part of that manifestation and that new nature should be a loving spirit, a loving heart toward others, and particularly of those of, of like precious faith. It is, the love that this, it is the love that is in this epistle that urges those professing the, the Christian faith to, to prove their profession by simply going on with that faith. Not just going, just starting and then sort of stopping and going out and going in a different direction. It should be, we should see it in a continuous walk. Doesn't mean that we can't fall off. 
It doesn't mean that we can't fall in the ditch. It doesn't mean that we don't sometimes backslide. But if we're a true child of God, God's going to get us our attention and we should be getting back on that path again. You see, one evidence of genuine conversion is a genuine love for God's saints. You know, John, that great apostle of love, wrote, he said in 1 John 3, 14, he says, We know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. It's important that we understand this. And it may even be good for us to even look at more if we look at this verse as I had uh, suggested a little earlier. I think I said 1 John 1, but it should be 1 John chapter 3 and verse 11. We're going to read through a few of these uh, uh, verses here. And I think it's just so good as we get a real focus, helps us to f- focus on what the Word of God has to say concerning love. It begins in verse 11 by saying, For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. I mean, that's very easy, isn't it? Who are we to love? We're to love one another. And it goes on to say, Not as Cain, who was that wicked one and slew his brother, and whereof slew he himself, slew slew he him, because his own works were evil and his brother's righteous. So he lets us know he did this because he was an evil man. That's why Cain did what he did. And he slew the righteous brother. But he says, marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you, we know that we have passed from death unto life, because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer, and ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoso hath, but whoso, but who, but whoso hath the, this world's goods, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Hereby we know that we are of that we are of the truth and shall, uh, and shall assure our hearts before Him. For if our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our hearts, and knoweth all things. Beloved, if our hearts condemn us not, then we, then we are confident toward God. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of Him, because we kept His commandments, and do those things that are pleasing in, in His sight. Now please notice this next verse I'm going to share with you, verse 23. And this is His commandment, that we should believe on the name of the Son of Jesus Christ and love one another as he, has, as he have given us command. And he that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him, and he in him. And hereby we know that he abideth in us by the Spirit which he hath given us. You see, by God's grace we are to love those who are fellow members of the body of Christ. And Jesus goes on and says in John 13, 34, He says, A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another, as I have loved you, and that you also love one another. But this shall all, And by this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if you love one another. My friends, can you see how important love is in a Christian's life? And how it should be manifest in all that he does. Now in verse 2 it goes on to say in Hebrews 13, 2 it says, be not, uh, uh, be not forgetful to, to, I'm sorry, be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware. Christian compassion reaches out, not only to the saints that we know, but also to the strangers. You know, there's a number of examples of this in the scriptures. Certainly we can think of Abraham when he was in that tent, with Sarah in the tent, and those three men came up. Some believe that those three were actually three manifestations of, 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 of the Lord himself. Others see it as, as, as Jesus Christ and two other angels. But anyhow, we see the hospitality that Abraham offered up to him at that time. And then he began to realize who it was that he, that he was speaking with. We see the same thing with Lot as they left there and went on into Sodom and and Lot, uh, Lot met them and invited them into his home. We know that the, the horrible things that went on there 
and then uh, only he and, and his, his immediate family uh, left out of, of that area. Again, he, he entertained angels unaware. And of course, we can think of Gideon as well. You all may remember Gideon, you know, in, in, uh, in uh, the book of uh, Judges. You know, here he was hiding out from the enemy and just a lowly guy kind of trying to hide and make a little food for his family. They literally took everything. And then this angel comes to him and he doesn't even know he's just a man, but he, he gets in a conversation and then discovers he is an angel and he becomes a great, great, uh, a great, great man of God as he leads his people in victory in that situation. And of course, we all know Daniel. Now, not so much unknown because we know that Gabriel came to answer his prayer when he was praying about all that was going to take place. And God shows him in the book of Daniel, we have a tremendous revelation of the history, of history itself from the book of Daniel. And we see that not only that, but we also see that some, to some extent the spiritual warfare that goes on in the same situation. So we look at the archangel Michael who had to come to Gabriel's rescue because he was being held up by the prince of Persia. I don't want to get into all the different things that we could talk about here. It's not a, world, it's not a worldly situation. This is a spiritual thing. But it talks about the spiritual warfare that is real and really going on out there in the world. Yes, these things are real and we need to be aware of it. You know, and of course we all can think of Mary and Joseph. We saw how the angel Gabriel came to them, told them about the events that were going to, uh, were going to take place. Take Zachariah, uh, Zacharias, as he was told about, his, about having a son when he was way too old to have one. As we all know, John the Baptist. There's so many different things. But I do want us to just think about for a moment, as we think about the scriptures, would it, would it seem, but, it would, but it would seem from the scriptures that many have entertained strangers unaware. You see, the Bible doesn't tell us because if, if they're unaware, we don't necessarily know. But I'm going to ask you a question here this morning. You may answer this in a, in a very positive realm. Have you ever had an unusual experience that later you thought was literally beyond explanation and was, yet was real profound in your life? I know many people that have. Many of us have heard the testimony of Dan Schock here in this, in this, in this church. And we know about Dan Schock who was uh, involved in this horrible hit where a car had hit him at a real high rate of speed and literally he should have died from that accident he was knocked some 34 35 feet in the air or even maybe even further and he was in a total mess took the helicopter literally about 45 minutes before it got there but Dan talks about this woman that was there at his side he was unconscious for a bit but as he came to she was holding his hand very tightly and I believe her first question to him was did he know Jesus Christ? Did he know Jesus Christ? And then she began to talk to him, ask him about who he was and all of that. And then she began to pray with him. Well, later, as he, after he'd been in the hospital and a number of things, I think he wanted to find out who this was. And there was all the people that witnessed that accident, all of those people that were there, no one could recall seeing this woman that was right by his side holding his hand all of this time. You see, I think he may have met one of those angels. And you know, it happens in so many different ways. It doesn't have to be a major thing like that. It can be in some other kind of crises, maybe just a personal crisis that we can see this thing. So it's real good to consider these things. But let us consider, as we look at this, what the Lord had to say about it. If we look at Matthew 25 and verse 31, we'll read a little bit there if you want to turn to Matthew 35, I mean 25, and we're going to start in verse 31. It says, When the Son of Man shall come in His glory and all the holy angels with him. Then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. But before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as the shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on his left. Then shall the king say un, unto them on his right hand, Come ye, blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was a hungered, and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee a hungered, and fed thee? Or thirst and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger and took thee in? Or naked and clothed thee? 
Now notice what the Lord answers. And he says, And the king, and the king, and the and, and the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily, I say unto you, inasmuch as you have done it unto one of the of the least of these of mine, of my brethren, you have done it unto me. That's an important verse, my friends. We forget these things. I think it's easy to sometimes forget these. Of the right heart, the right right attitude. See how God what God thinks of this this thing. You know, it's, <clears throat> it is clear that to offer loving hospitality to the least stranger or the brethren is equivalent in our Lord's sight to literally serving Him. In the day of this writing, it was true there was there was ends, but they were but 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 many were dangerous for a Christian. Christians in that day were frequently in danger for their lives on account of their faith. Now, if you would please look at verse 3 with me in, in uh, Hebrews chapter 13 now. So we look at this first. It says, Remember them that, that are in bonds, as bound with them, and them which suffer adversity, as being yourselves also in the body. You see, it's good for us to remember that at the time of, the, of, of, of this letter, Nero was literally on the throne. He, he served from 54 A.D. to about 68 A.D. With the, I don't know how much you know about the history of Nero. Won't spend much there this morning. But one thing he did, he in the time that he was there, he started a big fire in Rome. I think his purpose of that fire was to burn down part of the city so he could rebuild it for his own. The big, big thing back then was to build things for your, um, uh, for your legacy. That they'd have all these monuments. He could rebuild all of these things. The problem was he started to get blamed for it, and the people started to get upset with him. So he needed an scapegoat. So he picked on the Christians. And so he blamed them for it. And then, in the most cruel and barbaric methods, he put many and many to death. It was a horrible situation, one of the most horrible in history. Many saints of that old, of, of old were, the others were just simply cast into prison for the Savior's sake and suffered loss of one kind or another, all because of their faith. Others still underwent adversities of various sorts. And I think we can think of Paul and many of the other characters we can read about in the Scriptures and Know of the various imprisonments and the and the scourgings and the different things that had happened to them uh, for their faith and 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 for their uh, uh, well basically just for their faith in, in in the Lord. You know the world has not ever been an easy time. We have had easy here, but I don't know how long that's going to be. I think the church is very much under attack today, and we may begin to find, uh, be a, there may become a time that we're going to have to make some real hard choices as to what direction we're going to go. And what we're, what, where we're going to take our stand. I just say this, that Paul stated, he said, for this cause, I, Paul, am a prisoner of Jesus Christ, in Ephesians 3.1. You see, Paul was a prisoner, and he recognized he was a prisoner for the Lord's sake. You know, you and I need to be willing to face those things. But we also see how he talks about the, the, uh, the, the how, how he has commendation to those that were helping him during that time, that were that were giving to him. For example, in Hebrews 10.34 it says, For ye had compassion on me and my bonds, and took joyfully the spoils of your goods, knowing in yourselves that ye have in heaven a better and, and enduring substance. They were giving to him at a time when he had a great need for it. And then we can, of course, think of the, of the whole epistle of Ephesians. It's really about, I mean, about Philippians, which is really a letter written to this particular church, thanking them for their support. But I'll share these few verses with you. In Philippians 4.10 it says, I rejoice in the Lord greatly, that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again, wherein ye were also careful, but ye lacked opportunity. Now that I speak in respect, not that I speak in respect of want, for I, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. I know both how to abase, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Notwithstanding, you have well done that ye did communicate with me in my affliction. You see, let us always remember that as if you're a child of God here this morning, you are part of the body of Christ. Let us remember that we're all one body. And in 1 Corinthians 12.25, we read that there should be no schisms in the body, 
but that the members should have the same care one for another. And whether one member suffereth, all members suffer with it. Or one member be honored, all members rejoice with it. Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. The point being made here is a very simple point. Just as our bodies are one, if I hurt my hand, it affects all of my body. There's pain throughout my body. I have a less ability to do other things in my body. Everything feels that, that pain in that sense. As a child of God and being a part of His body, when the church, speaking of the body of Christ, is suffering, then I should be suffering along with that. When I see one of my brothers or one of my sisters in a suffering type of situation, I should have compassion, godly compassion upon that individual and see it as such. So today, remember them that are in bonds, as bound with them, and they that suffered adversity as, as being ourselves also in that body. Now look at verse 4 of Hebrews 11. It says, Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. You know, there is a, today there is a great, great attack upon the institution of marriage. Marriage is one of the very first institutions that were set up by God. Adam and Eve, the Bible tells us, were married. Genesis 2.23 Adam said, This is now bone of my bone, and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked. And the man, please notice, and his wife, the Bible tells us, and, 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 and his wife, and were, and were not ashamed. You know, today, marriage is often seen as just being archaic. And even if it's a valid marriage, the world's idea is, it's, is, is, is that it should be entered into only after a period of, of promiscuity and experimentation. In other words, let's live together for a while and see if it kind of works out like that. With reservations, and also with this great reservation, that you know something? If it doesn't, we'll just get divorced. They just see it very, um, uh, I'm trying to think of the right word, just, they cast it off so easy, they're very cavalier is the word I'm looking for. It's a very cavalier thing. It's something that just is now, can change, and whatever. They don't understand how important marriage is and what the marriage bond is all about. We see pornography and X-rated films that are fanning the flames of lust and do and have destroyed multitudes of lives and of families as well. But you know something, my friends? The world, like the world, always wants us to believe that it's changed. What was true then is not so true today. That is not true. God's Word is always true and it doesn't change. And he has not changed. So when we read here and it says, Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers are God, God will judge. Satan has gained, I believe here, a major victory, uh, a, 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 literally a major vi victory. We see homosexuality, open sex partnerships, even in marriage, and the world encouraging it to be so. We see that the laws today are so oftentimes designed to protect those that are into these uh, that are in these abominable type of relationships and things. These things are being protected. And not only that, they're being taught in our schools and being forced upon our children. And if someone objects, someone decides they're going to speak out, they're typically called a racist, a bigot, and guilty of hate speech. Hate speech is often used today to silence that are literally just free speech. God can and will forgive anyone for their sins. If they will come to the Lord with a true heart and ask for His forgiveness, He will forgive them. These are not without, are, 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 are not lost. They can be saved. But they need to get these sins and understand what they are. But you know, for any sin that there is, there's going to be consequences. A wise person once said, the choices we make limit the number of choices we can make. 
things that we do will limit other things that we might have been able to do by the choices that we made. So it's important to consider those things. Now in verse 5 of Hebrews 13, it says, Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as ye have. For he has said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. Let your conversation, that word conversation means conduct. So the, so the word for conversation is used in Scripture, and we can see it noted in different ways. For example, in Philippians 1.27 it says, Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. So only let your, only let your conduct be as it becometh of, of the gospel of Christ. That wherein I am come to see you, or lest be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. One of the great principles of the Christian life is contentment. God, literally, is our ultimate provider. You know, He feeds the birds, and He feeds all the animals. He sends the rain, brings the harvest in springtime. You know, the Lord knows everyone's need, everyone's specific needs. And He knows our various circumstances. And He knows all about us. And you know, the wonderful thing is, He's promised to meet those needs in His Word. Philippians 4.19 says, But my God shall supply all of your needs according to His riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Do you believe that here this morning? If you do, if you do, then you simply need to learn that we can trust Him, whatever, whatever state we find ourselves in. Just as Paul talked about, whether he be abased or whether he be full, whether he be, whether he be hungered or unhungered, he knew he could trust the Lord for whatever circumstances befell him, and he could have complete confidence in Him. As a believer, we have Christ. Think about that. As a believer, we have Christ. What greater riches are there than this? The trials and adversities may come. Possessions may be lost and liberties taken. But we are to be content, partakers of God's grace, which is sufficient, knowing that we have in heaven a better and enduring substance because we have all eternity with the Lord. Now we come to Christian courage when we look at verse 6 of Hebrews 6, 13. It says, so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. And I will not fear what man shall do to me. Let us remember that the Hebrew Christians were facing persecution from not only their, their, their foes, but they were facing it from their family and their friends even. You know, we've seen a little bit of that. I've heard about it in the news now. Where they, there are some people that are, that are being encouraged to go out from the government and tell about what their neighbor did concerning this coronavirus. I saw them without a mask or something. I think it's something like that. It makes me think of Nazi Germany when they're trading, teaching the kids to go out and turn their parents in for all kinds of things. Is that the kind of world that we want to live in? Or that anyone would want to live in? There is a world coming that that will not be the case. A world in which righteousness rules. And the king that sits on the throne is none other than our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I think God may be using this very persecution right now that's going on, the, the, all that we're seeing with the coronavirus, to separate somewhat the wheat from the shaft. Those who merely profess Christianity from those who are genuinely saved and truly trusting the Lord. Let us remember that the Hebrew Christians were facing persecution from family, from friends, and foes alike. God may be using these very, this, the very persecutions to separate the wheat from the shaft. Those who merely profess Christianity from those who are genuinely saved. Let us always remember that this world is not our home. And that it hated our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, it's going to hate us as well. Throughout world history, it has been hard for the Christian. There's been very few eras that, that the Christian has had it easy. I believe we've had the privilege of living through one of those easier periods for the most part. But as a child of God, our lives should reflect the victorious life that we have in Christ. Nothing can take away the eternal life and joy that we have through Christ. Therefore, we are to live and to face the world with complete confidence and with courage. Romans 8.35 says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? 
Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or perils, or sword? As it is written, For thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. True, I believe true courage is truly born through the growth, through our growth in faith. Deepening love and hope beyond the veil. Do we, have the, do, do we have the conviction so that we may boldly say, as the psalmist did in 118.6, when he said this, the Lord is on my side and I will not fear what man can do to me? Do you have that confidence that you literally have nothing to fear? There's nothing in this world that can happen to you? Or that you need to fear because you know that number one, the Lord's on your side. And then number two, that you have Him and you can count on Him in all things. Now in verse 7 in Hebrews 13, it says, Remember them which had the rule over you, who has spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith followeth, considering the end of their conversation. Hebrews 13, 17 says, Obey them that had the rule over you, and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls. As they that have give, that must give an account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. You see, three times in this in this final chapter of the epistle, we're going to see where we see that they, that they had the rule over them, and we see the instruction is given. The first, as we just read in, in verse seven, we are to remember. It says they are to re, that we are to remember them. The second is. Is in, is, as we see in verse 17, which we just read as well. It tells us here that we are to obey. And then in verse uh, 24, it tells us that we're to salute them. We'll be looking at several of these a little later on in our studies. But if, we're to, if we are to truly examine, examine these verses, and when we look at this, we say, them that had the rule over you, what is it, who is it talking about? Well, it signifies the leaders and the guides that, that we're to have in the Christian experience. This is not an, not an implied approval of ecclesiastical authority as in the sense of the Pope or as we think in the Catholic Church. But it is rather a divine recognition that God has given His servant who He has called to be the leader. These are gifts and we know that these are gifts to the church. In Ephesians 4.11 it says, And He gave some apostles, some prophets, and some evangelists. And we see, then it goes on to say, And some pastors and teachers and for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the of the ministry and for the edifying of the body of Christ we see that he's given this gift to the church we see he's even telling us what they're for that they're there to to, to help to perfect the saints to help us to grow in our grace in, in in grace and in truth through the word of God for the work of that ministry and for edifying encouraging us in that area you know this isn't only new for the uh this is this is only for the New Testament. We had uh, we had uh, teachers and we had uh, basically pastors. Even the word pastors in the Old Testament, we would see. But these leaders are are said to be those who have literally the Word of God. How do you know them? Well, they're going to know. They're they're going to be the ones that, that have the Word of God. They are those who's who from whom these uh, from whom the Word actually flows. They may not be the most charming. They may not even be the most strong willed, or the greatest. Uh, uh, orator or even the most eloquent in speech even Paul said he didn't think he was all that elegant in speech we never heard him actually speak I can tell you he could sure could write boy I can only imagine what it would be like to be one of his sermons but that wasn't the point those that have been called are to remember are to be remembered and obeyed and saluted not for their sake not for their work's sake but because they have been divinely appointed and they are now the under shepherds for the Lord we are not to, we're not instructed to follow them. However, because of, well, primarily because, you know, they may fail. They're simply men. But we are not to, nor we try to imitate these leaders as, 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 as in their manner or method. But here's what we are to do. We're to look and to follow their faith. Look at their faith that they have. Faith that causes them to depend upon God. The faith that they have to walk before Him in a separated way to pray with confidence, to speak His Word in power, 
and in the Holy Spirit and in the abundant and in abundant fulfillment. And in the New Testament church, we have them. And we should be praying for them. You know that they pray for us. You know they're lifting us up before the Lord. They're, they're meeting, they're, they're, they're there for us to help us in all ways. But we need to pray for them as well. We have to remember, we're all part of the body. In 1 Thessalonians 5.11 it says, Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also ye do. And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake, and be at peace among yourselves. Yes, they are God's gift to the church, to shepherd the church, to lead, encourage, teach the word of God in season and out of season, and to love the word, and to love the Lord and his people. This is a true under-shepherd of the Lord. And we are to esteem them very, very highly. And obey them in the Lord, as the Word of God teaches. Now the last part of this we see in verse 8, that we'll conclude our study here this morning. We're going to look at Hebrews 13 and verse 8. It says, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. Those are some really powerful words if you really begin to think about what the meaning of that is. Everything in our world is relative, but with the Lord, nothing is relative. What a blessing to know a God that whatever is true today will be true forevermore. You see, the Word of God is eternal. His promises are eternal. His love is eternal. His righteousness is eternal. His wisdom is eternal. The Son of God, the incarnate Word, was with the God before the world ever was. The eternal Son, He was the same, and He is the same as He is today. He is the eternal Son, all the way back, and He's the same today, the same as He is today, and as He will be tomorrow. What we know of Christ is the same from time past, all the way through, 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 through eternity forward. However, it's kind of interesting that when we see the human name Jesus in this passage, it kind of has a simple, it, has, it kind of suggests this. Simply stated, it just states that the Lord is literally unchangeable. There's nothing, there's no changeableness in the Lord. His word will be for all eternity, and for all eternity His truth is His truth. It will never change. His love and mercy are also forever. And will be the and will be the everlasting joy, and we, and where we will experience His everlasting joy in His presence, and we will have that for all eternity. In Second Corinthians uh, nine, it says, "But at as, as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love Him. But God hath revealed them unto us by His Spirit." For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given us of God. You see, my friend, if you're here as a child of God this morning, I pray you are. If you are, the moment that you became a child of God, you were indwelled with the Holy Spirit. By that, by, by that indwelling, you now became a part of the family of God. And as such, you now also have spiritual discernment, spiritual wisdom that can only come through God. Remember, you have the indwelling of the Spirit, the one that, the one that literally wrote this book, living within you. But you know something? We must willingly... Seek out the Lord's will in our life. The Lord doesn't force His way in our life. We must literally seek and ask God to help us to the walk that we have every day because it's a challenging walk. None of us have an easy walk. All of us are going to stumble and fall. There's all these pressures pushing this way and that way to distract us from the direction that we should be with the Lord. From the path that He has for us. What we need to do is constantly be lifting up keeping that relationship close with the Lord, seeking His will and His direction in every aspect of our life. Not just the big things, not just on Sunday, but in each and every day, seeking the way that He would have us to go. 
The love that reaches forth to us is from heaven today. Will embrace us in tenderness and grace throughout all eternity. Jesus is the same yesterday and today. If you're here as a child of God, the eternal word of God promises, as we see in Romans 8, 14, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are what? The sons of God. So in other words, my friends, if you're here as a child of God this morning in your home, wherever you are listening to this message, by God's grace, the word of God tells us that you are literally a son of God. It goes on to say, for you have received the spiritual, you, you received the spirit of bondage again, uh, it says, for you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. That's words you don't find in the Old Testament very often, the word Father, speaking of God. We have a much more intimate relationship in this dispensation. The Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, my friends, look at what the Word of God says. This isn't me speaking, not the pastor speaking, not anyone speaking. But God Himself says this. This is His Word. He says, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and join heirs with Christ. My friends, we don't deserve the least of his mercies. And yet God, in his word, has said, this would be blasphemy if it wasn't, it wasn't in the word of God, it wasn't God that was saying it, that we're going to literally be joint heirs with him. We can't even begin to imagine or fathom what, what it's going to be like when we're, when we're in his presence. And it's, but it goes, that's what it does say. It says, if so be that we suffer with him. That's not an easy call, is it? We like the first part. But the second part tells us that there's going to be some suffering for the Christian. Most of us are going to have some suffering in our lives. And it's through that suffering, it goes on to say that we may be also glorified together. What a blessing. We're going to be glorified. And then in Romans 8, in the next verse 18, it says, "For and then Paul says this. And I think this is wonderful. We're going to close with this. I reckon... Don't you like that word? He was a good southern boy. I reckon that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. What a blessing it is, my friends, to be a child of God. Let us live the glorious promise in the life that we have in Christ, relishing all that we have through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. With that, we're going to go ahead and close. Thank you for your time this morning. Father, we just thank you for this time. Thank you for your word. Father, we ask that you would work in our lives and help us to grow just a little bit more in your grace and your truth. Help us to learn how to be more dependent upon you in all facets of our life. Help us to know you better. And Father, help us to love one another as we should in Christ. I ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen.